Hello and welcome back to London Cycle Routes. Today I'll be showing you how to cycle from Richmond Park in southwest London right into Westminster in central London. This ride takes about 50 to 55 minutes and the vast majority of it is on quiet streets and protected cycle lanes with a long stretch along the river. If you were to take this route via public transport it would actually probably take you about 70 to 75 minutes depending on where you were going in Richmond Park so it's actually a really good idea to cycle. If you find this video useful or you just enjoy watching it then make sure you subscribe to the channel because I post new routes like it every week. Alright let's get going. So we're starting at Roehampton Gate which is the most northerly gate at the park and you come out of the gates but instead of going down the main road turn left onto these residential streets now this is a bit annoying because normally you would keep going down that road here but actually when I came to film this video the street was closed because they were doing some work with a crane there but it doesn't matter we can actually go along here on this other residential street which is parallel to it and frankly it's fine this street is not a low traffic neighborhood or anything like that but it is just a road where there's not really any reason for anybody to be driving down here so you're not really going to encounter any traffic one thing I would say though is that actually when the park gets busy and people drive to the park I'm not sure why you would do that but people do it um, people might look down these roads for parking and stuff like that so do be aware of that then we turn back onto Bank Lane and um, if the street we were originally supposed to be going on wasn't closed you would come out here you can see the closure sign there um, going up Bank Lane here at the end of this street we're basically going to be rejoining the main road that we would have come out of the park on if we'd just gone straight ahead except it actually has a little cycle track alongside it just starting here um, this is Priory Lane this is the main road going to the park now Priory Lane cycle track is a little bit controversial as you can see from the people whizzing past us on bikes not everyone actually uses it it's mostly people who sort of dress up in lycra and do sports cycling who do that um, no offence to them, you know, if you want to do that, that's fine, but that's not really what the channel's about. The reason that they do it is, if, there's a few reasons, it's not really a great cycle track, it's quite narrow. There is actually enough space to pass people on it just about at low speed. The surface isn't fantastic, the pavement's quite narrow as well, so pedestrians tend to wander into it, and you can see it doesn't always have priority over side roads and driveways, um, which is actually not a great design. There's one coming up here where you're actually supposed to give way. Um, all that contributes to people not using it. Now Richmond Council has actually put out a consultation to replace the cycle lane or I should actually just say take it away um, because it annoys drivers so much to see cyclists not use it basically. Um, I think that would be extremely bad but yeah you know it does the job here for us. Now at the end of the cycle lane just come out here onto the street and then go across the crossing when the, when the light's green and we'll come out onto Vine Road now this street is relatively quiet um, it has quite a lot of traffic calming on it so things like speed bumps which you know they're not great but you'll see in a second why it's particularly quiet um, just coming up here oh that's a train yeah it's uh, got a level crossing on it in fact it doesn't just have one level crossing on it it's got two level crossings on it um, which basically deters drivers from using it um, it's not the best deterrent there's probably better ways to do that slightly overkill if you were only going to do it for that but we're only on it for a short period of time and it does the job for us now right after the second level crossing we've turned off onto Barnes Common um, then this path is not particularly well serviced it doesn't have a tarmac or anything like that but I'm using a road bike with you know thin tires and my bike seems to go fine on here I wouldn't expect to get any punctures and it is only for a short period of time now it is an option to turn off onto Barnes Common before you get to the level crossings which means you wouldn't have to deal with them but unfortunately you have to get over the railway somehow and the alternative to the level crossings is actually to sort of slog your bike over the railway at Barnes Station on the footbridge which I think most people would probably say isn't quite as good you could do that if you want though but uh, either way you get here and we're actually on this very narrow track alongside Barnes Common. This, believe it or not, is actually a designated cycle route. Um, it's not the best, but as you can see, you can, not comfortably, but you can pass people who are walking down it, and it's a relatively low, sort of, low pedestrian uh, footfall. So it shouldn't be too much of a problem, and as I say, it is only a short period. Unfortunately, the cycling infrastructure around Richmond is not fantastic, but this keeps us away from the traffic. Um, and you can see here actually uh, you cross onto the other side of the street and there's this sort of weird or on pavement cycle lane that is evidence that you are actually following uh, what was at some point intended to be a cycle route but anyway we go on to St Mary's Grove St Mary's Grove is filtered so there's no traffic on it unfortunately the filter is incredibly bad it's not 
very disability friendly certainly um, none of the beginning of this route is unfortunately you have to push your way through these little very narrow gap in the uh, wooden poles they put in the ground but then you come out here and you go on to Dryburg Road what we're essentially doing now is we're picking our way through the uh, residential back streets to the west of Putney and we're going to come out at the end of this onto Putney High Street not on this street, but actually some of the streets we're about to go through are actually a historic low traffic neighbourhood, a historic LTN. So um, low traffic neighbourhoods, they've sort of hit the headlines recently as a, a major policy that councils are rolling out during the pandemic. But they're not actually a new idea. A lot of housing developments are either designed to be low traffic neighbourhoods or they've had them retrofitted. And this area here uh, on Clarendon Drive and the streets around it are actually is actually a really good example of that. There are filters at the end of some of the streets, which means there's not actually a through route here for cars. So you're not going to run into any traffic at all. There's a number of different ways that you can pick your way through these streets, and that's one of the beauties of LTNs. There's not really a set route. It doesn't really matter which way you pick through these streets, as long as you end up on Felsham Road, which is the road which has the crossing we need for Putney High Street. Putney High Street, as you'll see in a second, is not actually a very nice street to cross, um, and it's certainly not a very nice street to cycle on there is a lot of traffic and the cars around here as you can see from the examples of parked cars are absolutely massive they are huge even a relatively small increase in traffic in this area would basically make it not a very nice place to cycle down but as it is it's all right so it's uh yeah it's kind of a testament to the layout of the streets and the sort of ltn design of it and you can see those people cycling and it's actually all right um, it doesn't remove all the traffic um, around the corner here in a second there's a bloke who i thought was actually driving on the wrong side of the road but he was actually just looking for a parking space so we'll give him a pass on this street here felsham street itself i do actually pass a couple of cars in the video for some reason and uh, i don't really know why they're here to be honest it might just be a coincidence ltns do allow people to access it so if a number of people decide to leave at the same time then yeah you will run into a few people um, this here is one of the filters that i was talking about uh, you can see here bikes are allowed through motorcycles and cars aren't and uh, yeah we come out here onto Putney High Street now what I recommend doing here is actually dismounting from your bike and just walking across the crossings this road is very unpleasant to cycle on so you know just uh, avoid it unfortunately the motorists don't make it easy this guy here has just squeezed us and several buggies and like 10 pedestrians into an even smaller space and then cross again here and wait for the green man there and then get on the road and you'll be able to cycle down it without having any traffic that's a little trick that you can do when there's a green man behind you and then we're immediately going to be turning off left here down brew house lane now i turn right here um through a little uh, sort of narrow street um you could actually go along the river here just for a second it doesn't really make any difference um do be careful here because there are sort of doors and people might you know come out of their homes or whatever but ultimately what's going to happen is you just come out here and end up on Deodar Road. This is a quiet residential street and uh, you can see from the cycle symbols on the road that is, it is intended to be a cycle route. Now it leads directly into Wandsworth Park which has a cycle track in it. There's a kind of a weird thing here, so coming up there's this gate and uh, you'll see that there's about like five different do not cycle, no cycling signs, please dismount signs. Somebody who lives there is very, very against cycling. So I've dismounted here just to set a good example, but I can't help but notice that this place is actually full with cars. So you're allowed to drive in here, but not to cycle. Now you might have noticed that there was a no cycling sign on the right there as we entered the park. That says don't cycle, don't turn right. It actually specifically says you have to turn left. So all the paths in this park are no cycling allowed except for this one down here so you're allowed to go down here and it's nice and wide and it goes along the Thames which is really quite pretty now one thing I will say there are, about this route there are a few parks on this route including this park and also later we go through Battersea Park which close at sundown so um, the route this route is only uh, valid during daylight hours um, however I don't think that's really too much of a problem because Richmond Park itself also closes at dusk. So for a route to get to Richmond Park where most people will be using the park, I think that's acceptable. I do try to avoid that in the videos because, you know, for a commuter route, it needs to be 24 hour ideally, or at least, you know, well into the night. But, you know, uh, in this case, I think it's probably okay. Now, for a lot of the next bit of the, the journey, we're going to be following the Thames path, which 
is a nice path in parts, but it's very, very bitty. A lot of it's controlled by the different landowners, the different estates that control it. So this is one of the bits where you can't just go along the Thames. It was closed when I came here. But we're going along this filtered street insert, which is fine. You can see these bollards keep all the traffic out, which is okay. It's pretty wide. It's basically okay. Um, but then we quickly rejoin the river. This bit is a little bit unusual. It doesn't just go right along the river. It's because there's actually a creek uh, going into the uh, land called Bell Lane Creek and also the River Wandle enters the Thames here, empties into the Thames. So um, what we're actually doing here is we're, we're crossing the creek. So this, it looks like we're crossing a river, but we're actually running parallel to the main River Thames. And uh, yeah, you're now crossing the Wandle here. So these, these two different creeks come in. And what we do here is we ride on this filtered street with no through traffic. Um, do actually be careful though, Smuggler's Way, great name for a road by the way, but do be careful because on our left here is actually the Western Riverside Waste Authority. That's essentially a big recycling centre, so there'll be trucks and lorries arriving at the recycling centre, so there is actually some traffic here. Um, we turn back onto the waterside path. By the way, I thought that was quite a weird use of riverside frontage because, you know, people like to live by the river. It's quite strange to have a recycling centre there. However, um, I do wonder whether maybe they bring some of the rubbish in by barge because that does happen. Um, so maybe it's, you know, one of the few examples of a sort of working industrial facility on the river. I don't know. Maybe someone could tell me in the comments. But yeah, we're, we're quickly back on to the uh, back onto the side of the riverside path now but only for a second. <laughs> we again have to turn off here. And uh, yeah, you follow down these basically these back streets. Now I realize this route's very twisty and turny. Um, you don't have to remember it all. It's actually quite intuitive when you're here. Um, you really just follow the path of least resistance along the river. And there are occasional signs pointing for the Thames path, which is essentially what we're following now. By the way, these cyclist dismount signs, they're not permanent, they're just part of the building site. So you wouldn't normally have to dismount here. But yeah, route finding shouldn't be a problem. Uh, especially if you look in the description of this video and you find the link to the map which I always put in the video and you can download GPS files there and use them with whatever app or device you use. Um, I often have a lot of people asking me you know can I get a map of this and all the videos have got maps I really should mention it in the video so that people remember or you know maybe people aren't aware in the first place but yeah so if you do need a map or a gps file download it from the description below um, it's on a website called commute but you don't have to use commutes app you can just download the uh, the gpx file or whatever it is that people use i actually don't really use uh, maps or devices um, when i'm cycling so i don't really know too much about it but i know that a lot of people do so i try to um, make that available for people Coming up here, the landowner of this part of the Thames Path has decided that they want to put a chicane in here. Um, I'm actually really, really against these, as you might not be surprised. Uh, I think they're terrible. Um, they don't help pedestrians and they don't help cyclists. I think, I'm pretty sure managers put them in because they think that, they imagine like a sort of lycra clad cyclist who's going to do 100 miles an hour, like British cycling style, down the riverfront or down a path. I Honestly, I don't really see that and to be honest when people are a nuisance I'm not saying people don't cycle irresponsibly or whatever I don't think that's going to stop them if anything it's just going to make people accelerate um, but what it does for you know the vast majority of people is it doesn't just inconvenience cyclists it also creates pinch points with pedestrians and cycles um, so it's now more dangerous to cycle down and you know it gets in everybody's way when two people meet each other coming the other way it's particularly ridiculous in a time of social distancing although you know outside it doesn't really that probably doesn't really matter too much but yeah um, that's one of the things about the river path being managed by loads of different management companies and authorities is that they basically it's all basically their own little fiefdom so some of them think chicanes are fantastic and stick them in others are not but you can cycle along the whole thing and it's basically all good now, um, just to help you get your bearings, we're passing under Battersea Railway Bridge there. And um, this is one of the nicer bits of the Thames Path, I think. That there's not so much sort of glitzy offices here, and it's just an estate which has a nice sort of Thames front, which, you know, that's really what the whole Thames Path should be, to be honest. It should all have, you know, affordable housing for people, but I digress. As you, uh, as you go on here and as you go past this little archway, by the way, make sure you stick to the right-hand side of the arch. If you were to go to the left of this pillar, um, that would be quite a squeeze. This should go without saying, but the whole of the Thames path is a shared path between pedestrians and the cycles, so make sure you cycle at a moderate pace. 
and you know give people a wide berth and just be considerate generally um, I actually think that even if you're cycling slower here you're going to make faster progress than if you are on the roads because you may notice that we haven't stopped at a single traffic light since we left it now this church here is lovely it's really pretty it's called St Mary's Church Battersea and uh, this is famous because uh, a gentleman called Benedict Arnold is buried here he was uh, an American Revolutionary War general who betrayed the US and his name is basically a byword in the US for a traitor um, he eventually ended up in London as you might expect uh, shout out on the left there, by the way, to the towers of the World's End Estate. I think it's a very fetching, brutalist sort of red brick estate. And uh, crucially, I think as well, you know, it gives social tenants en masse like views of the river, which is really nice and something that you really just couldn't imagine happening today, especially in a borough like Kensington and Chelsea, where the uh, estate is actually based. You, you definitely wouldn't expect that real estate to be given over to social tenants today. Um, as you can see from the vast majority of this side of the river, which is uh, sort of, was developed a little bit later, most of it is offices and luxury flats. Now we're coming up to Battersea Bridge Road, so this is the road that leads to Battersea Bridge on the left, and the way you cross this is you simply just wait for a gap in the traffic. The Thames Path restarts here, and actually this is one of the few places where I tell you you really should dismount. There's no sign saying you have to, but this is basically a ramp, and it's extremely narrow. It's not appropriate to cycle down there. So yeah, get off your bike if you can, and rejoin it at the Thames Path. Now, uh, this little open space here, it's all right. Bit sterile, but yeah, uh, this office building is notably the headquarters of Foster and Partners, the architecture firm that basically designed all the sort of big glass buildings of the noughties. So they did City Hall, they did the Millennium Bridge, they did the Rice Dag redevelopment, they did the big roof in the British Museum Great Court. And um, these signs here, by the way, I have no idea what they're trying to say. It says both no entry and right turn. Let's just assume that they only apply to cars. Um, I think they're part of the building site rather than something that a traffic authority has actually installed. Um, we're coming out here onto Park Gate Road, and this is going to take us to the Park Gate of Battersea Park. Um, it's not a particularly nice road to cycle on. It's not awful, but it's basically fine, um, just for a very, very short period. But yeah, uh, do be aware of that. Um, we're going into the park here. The reason that we left the Thames Path a bit early and went along that street is because Batty Park, just like Wandsworth Park, only has a few sections that you're allowed to cycle on. You can't cycle on the section that goes with the Thames Path, even though the Thames Path is cyclable up to the park, which seems a little bit ridiculous to be honest. But yeah, we've uh, come out here onto the uh, this big wide road, which is the only bit of the park that you're allowed to cycle in. Interestingly, that building coming up on our left there, you can see it's a pagoda. It's actually the London Peace Pagoda. Um, it was a gift to the city and uh, basically sort of represents peace. Um, it was inspired by the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki via a kind of Buddhist movement. Um, but yeah, interesting little piece of architecture. Now, you can see a lot of people use this cycle route. Um, now, the section of road that we're on is currently no traffic at all, but we're now coming onto a genuinely used street. But this street is filtered, so it's only really people accessing the car park for the park, which is a weird thing to say. Why does a park in central London have an absolutely massive park car park? It's kind of weird, um, but yeah, that's fine. So you really just keep going along here, and there's not very much traffic. Um, so we're going to be crossing the river on Chelsea Bridge. When I decided to do this route, I undenied about which bridge to use and I felt that this was probably the best simply because it was the easiest to get to. But the bridge itself is not fantastic. I think there's going to be some improvements to it soon. But what you do here is you go up onto a shared pavement here behind the bus stop just for a second and then come into the bus lane. So in this direction there is a bus lane which buses, taxis and cycles can use. In the opposite direction there's just a painted cycle lane. Neither are frankly my idea of good cycling infrastructure but there's not really many options here especially with Hammersmith Bridge closed. If there's any consolation it's only for a short bit. I mean that wasn't too bad was it? Now we want to go right here but the design of this junction is interesting it requires you to go left first so what you do is you go left into this bit here and you just wait in the blue spot. Now normally I cut out waiting at lights but I wanted to show you exactly what you're supposed to do here. You wait for all the traffic to go and then you wait for a green light in this direction and then you head. And that's actually not too bad. I think that's a pretty good way to do it, to be honest. I think that's a much more common setup in Denmark. You turn left to go right. And what that's done is that's taken us out into Grosvenor Road. And this is um, 
a cycle lane which used to be terrible and now it's actually pretty good it's been reinforced with ones under the street space program by transport for london during the pandemic the only bad bit is here where there's this isn't a bus stop it's a bus uh, stand where they tend to wait um that bus you could see was kind of annoying just be careful as you pass that but actually for most of it this is essentially a protected cycle lane um, these ones are good it's quite wide I think most people would feel very comfortable cycling on this um, it used to just be sort of blue paint which is not good at all you know that's totally inadequate but yeah that's the reason that I wanted to cross the river because on the other side of the river uh, there's not really very good cycling infrastructure there's a little bit going on going in on uh, Nine Arms Road but it's still very very patchy and this is actually pretty good quality you can see um, there's a lot of people sort of there's plenty of people using it um, and yeah it's generally wide it's generally pretty good it's it's slightly intermittent particularly at junctions but it's a lot better than what you get on the south side of the river and actually it's a very very useful route now um, it's basically going to take us all the way into Westminster more or less except for the last bit by the way this is a good time to say that if you found this video useful please do hit subscribe on the channel um, I post new routes like this every week and they're always I always try to do them on quiet streets and protected cycle lanes this one's a little bit of a stretch there's a few bits which you know it's a little bit lower quality than usual but that's because it's such a long route and so many people have requested me to do Richmond Park and say how on earth do you cycle to this place because it's actually a bit tricky um, that you know uh, I thought I would do it and I think it's a decent route now we're going along Millbank here um, this is basically going into Westminster and um, that's the tape written on the left that's a really nice museum and uh, if they're open, I actually don't know if museums are open at the moment, but yeah, worth paying a visit to. It's got some Turner paintings in it. And uh, this is Millbank Tower on the left. This is the uh, site of the 2010 Millbank riot. So you can tell we're getting quite close into Westminster. Now, everybody knows the MI6 building at Vauxhall, but fewer people know the MI5 building, which is actually on our left here. It's a lot more understated, a bit classical. You can always play spot the government building in London by looking at this extremely long string of bollards on the left. That's to protect it from vehicle attacks. Um, it goes all the way around it, so you know you can't ram it with a vehicle. Now, this roundabout here, I didn't really want to go over. They're hopefully redoing it. Statistically, that roundabout, Lambeth Bridge, doesn't seem like very much, but it's actually a uh, statistically very dangerous roundabout. I think that's probably because a lot of cyclists use it. They've got a sort of temporary design in there, which makes it a bit better, but just be very careful when you go around that roundabout because uh, people have been injured going around it. Now, the cycle lane does actually give up a little bit here going into Westminster. That's because Westminster Council won't let TfL extend the protection, which is a shame because it's a gap. There's obviously the really good embankment cycleway on the other side of Parliament Square. Um, and there's the pretty good one on Grosvenor Road that we just came down. But yeah, this bit doesn't really have any protection until you get to Parliament Square, where it is now. And this is our final destination. Um, thanks very much for watching, guys. I, um, I'm i really pleased with this route. I think that, you know, it's quite a long one, but I think you'll probably agree that it's actually pretty pleasant the whole way. And it does avoid all the sort of long and difficult and busy and fast roads that you'd normally associate with actually getting to Richmond. It's quite a long way. Um, and it is, as I say, a lot faster for taking public transport, which was a big surprise to me. Richmond Park's not the most well-connected place when it comes to public transport. It's even a bit of a slog from Richmond Station. Um, and yeah, I hope a lot of people find this route useful. And as I say, if you did, do subscribe to the channel because I post new ones like it every week. They're always sort of safe cycle routes on protected cycle lanes and quiet streets. Thank you very much, guys, and see you again next time.